do it. Let's get into God's Word. Thank you, Blakey, uh, for reading that out. But when I was at Melbourne, when I was in Melbourne, I didn't just buy a denim jacket. Um, I also got to drive around in Melbourne. And so one thing about Melbourne compared to Sydney, very quickly, Melbourne and Sydney are quite similar in the culture. Quite a busy place, progressive, developed, lots of people, all that sort of stuff. But there are some differences about Melbourne and Sydney. So Melbourne, uh, Melbourne has far better transport and Melbourne, um, the roads are designed so much better. So have you ever been in Sydney and on the roads in Sydney, in the city I mean, and you, you take, I mean maybe you've just been in the car, you're not driving, but you take one wrong turn and it's like 20 minutes to get back to that one point where you need to get to. It's ridiculous. Melbourne's not like that. Melbourne's normal. So Melbourne has like what you call symmetrical and square kind of outlaying roads, right? It just kind of all makes sense. It's all straight and, you know, crossing over like that. What do you call that? Perpendicular and all that sort of stuff, right? It's all, it's all, it all makes sense. Sydney's like, like this. You just put your hands together like this, go in the air. That's what Sydney roads are like. Melbourne's not like that. But I got to, I got to drive in Melbourne. Um, you know what I love actually about the family of God is that no matter where you go in the world or in the nation, you can be blessed by God's people. So I got given a car when I got to Perth. I got given a car when I got to Melbourne. I don't have to pay for it. It was amazing. But I'm driving around in Melbourne, right? And um, in Melbourne, um, there are lots of those um, train crossings. Do you know what I mean by that? So in Sydney, there are only a few of them where you actually cross the train tracks in the car. And you've got to wait for the train to go past. Or usually there's no trains going past, so you just drive over. In Melbourne, there are a fair few of them. And you've got to drive over the tracks constantly. Um, and if you've ever driven over um, train tracks in a car on the road, you'll notice that there's this barrier that comes down. You ever seen that one? That comes down. Maybe you've got a toy train track thing at home. And there's this barrier that comes down that stops cars from going over the tracks. Why? Because there's a train coming and you don't want to get hit by it, right? So this, this good safety barrier that comes down and then when the, when the train goes past, it comes up and the green light goes so you can go across. You guys ever seen that? Yes? Okay, well there are a few of these in Melbourne, but what I want to point out is this barrier that comes down on the train tracks. And this barrier is a good barrier. It's safety. It actually stops you from getting harmed and hurt and getting crushed by the train that comes past. But we got lots of barriers in life, don't we? Have you ever hit a barrier in life? You're just like, I can't get past it. Sometimes there are good barriers that we should respect. Sometimes there are barriers that aren't so great that we have to overcome. Um, I don't know if you've ever, who here's ever laid in the bed in the morning and not wanted to get out. I just wanted to sleep in a little bit longer. All right. There's kind of this internal battle going on saying, I know I should get up, but I don't want to get up. My bed's so comfy and warm, particularly in winter. Right? You don't want to get out of bed in winter, you just want to stay in there, it's cozy, it's warm. But almost there's this barrier in your heart right, that you need to overcome to say, hey, I've got to get up, I've got to brush my teeth, I've got to have my breakfast or whatever order you do that in, I've got to have my shower, I've got to have my Milo and my vitamins, my get up for the day, right? I've got to get my school uniform on and head off to school into the car. Right? But there's barriers you need to overcome in life um, to get stuff done sometimes. Um, some barriers are not so great. You might be, you might have a relationship in life that's quite controlling. So maybe it's a friend who just has this latch over you, or a, a, a parent, or a teacher, or a boss. Someone who kind of controls your life, and almost the barriers become unhealthy. And they're ones, I believe, that we need to kind of overcome. But some barriers are good. Um, for your age, for young people, there are lots of age barriers, aren't there? So we can't drive a, t a car until we're what age? 16. We can't have our peas until we're when? 17. We can't drink alcohol until when? 18, right? We can't own a house until when? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Technically 18. But there are, and you look, most families wouldn't allow a 12-year-old to get up and travel the world for a month and then come back, right? There are some family, cultural, societal barriers that are in place for protection and safety and actually good for society. But there are lots of barriers in life. And some barriers are to be respected, but some barriers are to be overcome. And what I want to point out tonight, as we look at this, this passage, is that 
There are barriers that are in place around the people of God for the message of Jesus to do what Jesus wants it to do and go to the ends of the earth that need to be overcome. Someone say overcome. Barriers that these barriers that are in place need to be overcome. And see, what there's a couple of things that we need to understand first about the history of this um, nation called Israel, which are God's people in the Bible. So, I want to point out two things. Is that okay before we kind of get stuck into this? Yes, okay. Firstly, is that you might know this or you might not know this, but God. God, what he does, the creator of the universe, he creates two people, Adam and Eve, and then from Adam and Eve is birthed, eventually, this nation called Israel, and God says, they are my precious people and my nation. I'm going to be their God, and they're going to be my people. Amongst all the other nations, these people are mine. And he makes what he calls a covenant or an agreement with them, that he will... Um, fulfill his promises to them. And then he asks them to do the same back, that they would walk in his ways and trust him and obey him. So he creates his nation. um, He builds his nation, Israel. They're his precious people. But see, Israel, geographically, were locked down in one location. Um, Do you guys know where the Middle East is today? The the Middle East. Do you guys know where that is? Yes? Right? Do you guys know where Jerusalem is today? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but um, so God, um, so you might have heard in the Bible as well, the promised land. Yes. So God redeems his people out of Egypt, says, I'm going to take you to this promised land, the land of Cana. And at that land of Cana, once they eventually get there, right, he actually um, eventually becomes the city of Jerusalem, right? And then the city of David, and he puts his temple there. And then um, he puts this thing called the Ark of the Covenant, which actually symbolizes and represents God's presence with his people, So he's in this place, this one place in Jerusalem, and this is where the nation of Israel um, geographically are located, right, in this this area. So you know how Rudy Hill is here, and it doesn't move, right? God's people were, in a sense, in Israel, and they didn't move, they were there. Now there were were, um, some people... There were some Jews that were scattered around a little bit, but mostly they all lived there. The other, the other second thing was they all spoke predominantly one or two languages, Hebrew or Aramaic. Again, there's probably, there were some other languages mixed in because along the way as God's people came to this place um, and they did you know, life and, and, and whatnot, then other, other nations came and intruded and they mixed with other nations when they shouldn't have. And so there, there are some other languages there, but predominantly they speak two languages, Hebrew and Aramaic, okay? So we're getting this, so ge- geography... One location and one or two languages. But it's really weird because there's this tension that's created, which is actually a beautiful tension that we see that God kind of smashes today in this, in this passage, where the whole time God is saying, although you're in this one location, although you are my people Israel, I want you to be lights, just like these, for the nations, for the Gentiles. And he points that out in in particular in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 42, 49, and 43. He says, you guys, it's too small for you to just be my people in Israel. I want you to reach the world. I want you to be my witnesses everywhere. And then what does Jesus say a few times at the end of his ministry? He says, go and make disciples where? In Rudy Hill? All nations. And then he says, you will be my witnesses in the first chapter of Acts, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. He says at the end of Mark's gospel, I want you to go and preach the gospel to the, to the whole world. And he says again in Luke, you will be my witnesses to the world. Okay, so, so I'm just thinking, hey, God, right? So for example, it's like God saying, I want you, a person in Rudy Hill, to be a witness in Asia. Well, how that's going to happen? Aren't we located in Rudy Hill? And in a sense, there's this tension created, this barrier around geography and language where how is Israel going to be this witness, right? How are God's people going to be this witness to the nations, to the whole world, if they're stuck in one place and can only speak one or two languages? Well, I believe that's what this passage opens up for us. And there's this beautiful picture of God through power breaking down barriers for the mission of Jesus Christ. Who's keen to hear about this power? Yes? Well, let's have a look. Because first we're going to look at the power. God gives his people this power to break down barriers for them to actually do what he said. If we just want to remind ourselves what 
what verse 8 says in chapter 1 of this book, Acts, right? He says, you will receive power and you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. And then the whole book of Acts is that promise by Jesus coming into fruition. And we here sit today in Rudy Hill, whether you know this or not, right, as an outworking of what Jesus says right back here that we're experiencing this today. The gospel came to Australia. The gospel reached other nations. And now we are coming here in this time in history and hearing this message because of what Jesus promises right back then. So who wants to hear about this power that can accomplish so much? Let's do it. Let's get into it. Verse 1, read with me. You've got to remember, um, so Jesus promises this power, then he ascends into heaven. And you would have heard from Tooks and from Arn, wherever they are, preaching last week about this, almost like this preparation season for the disciples as they wait for this power that Jesus promises. And now we see today this power comes. And we're going to read and pick up from verse 1 in chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came. Turn to your neighbor and say, Pentecost. Pentecost. It's funny, we associate this word sometimes if you're around church with like denominations or with the Holy Spirit, but actually it's a Jewish festival, the day of Pentecost. You want to hear about this day of Pentecost? Just a little bit about what, what's happening here. We'll see this day of Pentecost, um, it really means 50 days after. Um, you guys heard of the, the story of God delivering his people out of Egypt, right? Well, see, God said, hey, I want you guys, you guys have a birthday, so you celebrate it once a year. Yes, I had my birthday last Saturday. We celebrate birthdays once a year. We celebrate Christmas once a year. We celebrate Easter once a year. You might have a family thing you celebrate once a year. Well, God said, I want you to celebrate some things to remember what I have done once a year. Remember what I did in Egypt, that I delivered you out of, out of um, Egypt and um, I allowed the angel of death to pass over, right? If you had the blood of the lamb on your door, right? So this is really significant this day, the day of Pentecost, I really want you to, to understand this. Um, when Jesus died, he died during the Passover festival. You see, in the Old Testament, they slaughtered a lamb, the people of Israel, and put the blood on the door so the angel of death would pass over so that it would be saved. Jesus dies on a significant date at the Passover time because he's the real Passover lamb. And if you're not a Christian here, you need to know, that if you put your trust in Jesus Christ, the real Passover lamb, he will shield you with his blood from the anger of God to fall upon you and for death to come once you die. But if you put your trust in Christ, that will pass over and that will not happen. You'll receive life and forgiveness. So when Jesus as the Passover lamb dies on this day, what happens is um, this day the day of Pentecost when the Spirit come is very, very significant. Because what they would do, the people of Israel would celebrate this festival of weeks for 49 days after the Passover. What's seven times seven? 49. 49. The seven days in a week, the festival of weeks. You can pick this up in the book of Numbers and Deuteronomy and Exodus, which you won't get into, right? And what they would do, they'd celebrate for 49 days. And then on the 50th day, someone say 50 on the 50th day, because what's one after 49? It's 50, right? They would celebrate the day of the first fruits and they would be able to grab all of the first fruits of their crops. I just moved into a place in Emu Plains. I haven't actually officially moved in, but we got a mandarin tree out the back. Woo! As that means in season, in season, the first fruits of the crop, when it first grows, the first kind of bunch of mandarins I can pick off and they're going to be the tastiest. I get to enjoy that. And the, the nation of Israel will get to enjoy the first fruits of all of their crops on this day um, of the, the first fruits. But it was 50 days after the Passover. Now we see that the Spirit's going to come on this day of Pentecost, the first fruits, because what it's representing is not physical fruit that's going to be birthed and reaped, but spiritual fruit. As we see later in this day, 3,000 people get converted and come to Christ. It's a picture of what's to come. As the Spirit falls, people put their faith in Christ and the harvest is reaped. So this day of Pentecost is very intentional. You need to know that God is very intentional. You might think right now in your life that stuff is happening is random. Whether it's a family situation or bullying at school or um, who knows what, what it is for you. 
But you need to know that God is not a random God. He's intentional. He does things with a purpose. And although you might not be able to see it now, you'll see it as you look back when you're in the future. And so you just need to know right now, God is an intentional God. He's not a random God. And He has an intentional purposeful word for us today as we keep reading. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. I want you to put your hand around your neighbor and say, we're all together in one place. All together in one place. All right, bring it back in. What's really significant to point out here is this. That the disciples were all together as one. We have a God who loves community. Amen. Amen. We have a God who loves people coming together. Amen. Amen. Why? Because He's a God that's in community with Himself. And from the very beginning with Adam and Eve, even with Adam, He says, it's not good that man be alone, but that they have a partner and a helper. And then from there, community was birthed. We were designed to be together. And some of us like to run the Christian life alone. And it's a very dangerous place to be. I just recently watched The Lion King. Ooh. Um, have you ever been to the movies? Do you, do, you, do you guys go to the movies a certain way? Do you know what I mean by that? Everyone has their own way of doing the movies. Yeah? So um, our family has a particular way of doing the movies. My mom has a Hoyt's card. And she has like a bazillion points on there. And we always get free food. That's just one thing we do. We won't usually be that early, but we'll get there on time. And when we go to the movies, we always get popcorn and we always get a drink and we always get choc tops. Anyone else? Amen to that? Yeah? Choc tops, man. They are delicious. They are delicious. Um, Different people, different families do movies a different way. And so for me, I love to get my choc top and I love to bite off the... um, So firstly, sorry, we don't start eating the choc top until the movie begins. Because it makes sense. You don't, want to not, you don't want to eat a choc top before the movie starts. I, I had a friend who used to do that. Their family would eat the choc top before the movie began and have nothing to enjoy during the movie. Does that make sense to you? doesn't make sense to me. We all have different ways of doing the movies. And we went, I went with my fiance, went and saw The Lion King, did the choc top thing and dipped it in the popcorn and ate it and it was really... And I like to have a mouthful of popcorn and then suck my Coke and then have it all in there, mushed it. I don't know why, it's just, it's just something I do, all right? Don't judge me. Don't judge me. Don't you judge me. Amazing stuff. We all do movies differently. And when I went to see The Lion King, in The Lion King, there's um, a pack of hyenas. I, I tried to remember the name of Sh- Sh- Shaniza? Sh- Shenzai? Thank you. Shenzai. And there's a group of hyenas. And what you need to know about hyenas is this. Hyenas never go solo. They are the scariest animal in the animal kingdom. I would rather face a lion. Seriously, because you face a lion, it's game over straight away. You just take it and you're you're done. But lions have a bit more respect. Hyenas are dirty players, man. I just, they're so vicious, they're so dirty. And with hyenas, they know not to go solo, but they know to, to hunt in packs. They can even bring down a lion if they work together. And see, the people of God are much stronger together than on their own. Amen? So God has created us to be in community. I want to say this. Your spiritual journey is only as strong as your community. If your community is weak, your spiritual journey will be weak. They were all in one place together at this day of Pentecost. And what happens next is quite um, extraordinary. Suddenly, I want you to say suddenly. What you need to know is God sometimes works suddenly. Sometimes he works slowly. Sometimes he comes quickly, but sometimes he takes a bit of time to work. Um, I thought of rain for this analogy. You know, um, even in Melbourne, it was raining all the time. And see, sometimes you can see a storm coming on. You know what I mean? It starts to trickle down, and then it slowly gets a little bit heavier, and over half an hour, the rain really comes down. But sometimes, have you ever been at home Um, And a storm comes out of nowhere. And then your mum's like, go get the washing off the clothesline, quick run. And you're running out and you're grabbing it off and you're bringing it back over. You ever been in those situations? You got to get the clothes off the clothesline because you don't expect the storm to come. Sometimes God works suddenly, quickly. Sometimes he works slowly and over time. You need to know that. Um, When I became a Christian, 
God really graced me with being able to overcome um, drinking habits, drug habits, sex habits immediately. That doesn't happen for everyone. Sometimes it happens slowly over time. And you need to know God here works suddenly. Suddenly, the scriptures say, a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven, filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire, which separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them to do. Here we see the Holy Spirit for the first time in history come on all believers, every Christian. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would only come on prophets, priests, kings, judges, um, some of the workers on the the temple, um, worship leaders, just significant people at significant times to empower them to do a task and not the whole nation of Israel. But here in the New Testament, we find for the first time God pours out His Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit um, is, is God. You can't see Him because He's a Spirit, but He works. You can see the effects of His work. The Holy Spirit is fully God. He was there at the beginning in creation. He was here in redemption. He empowered Jesus for ministry. He raised Jesus from from the dead. He empowers the church. And and you see here, um, we we get a significant aspect of how the Spirit works. What I want to point out is right now, we're not going to... The the Bible doesn't here in this text unpack all of the ways the Holy Spirit works. But He focuses... God focuses in on one particular aspect. Um, See, the Holy Spirit, we could go on for for about... Yeah, a couple of hours and just talk about he can empower us for ministry. He can give us gifts to use in the church. He brings us conversion and new birth, right? He gives us joy. He helps us sing. He helps us praise. He helps us in our weakness, right? All of those things are true, but right now he focuses, God focuses on one particular aspect of how the Holy Spirit works. Because what does Jesus say in Acts chapter 1 verse 8? You will what? Receive? Come on. You will receive? power. Why? For witness, because you will be my witnesses to the very ends of the earth. And here we see power come upon. And what I want to point out is is a couple of words in this this, um, part of the scriptures. um, Luke says that the Spirit came, what? Like a violent wind. And what? Like fire, tongues of fire. And the key words here are like. What, what Paul, I mean, what Luke is using here is metaphoric language in restraint to try and explain this supernatural thing that is going on in this house. Or actually, it's probably not a house. It might be a house. I'm not sure. In this place, on all the believers. Um, you guys ever flown a kite before? I want to pick up on the two analog- the, the metaphors used here, wind and fire. My nan gave me a kite when, when I was eight, and I don't remember ever flying it. But, anyway, um, I know how kites work. You guys know how kites work? If you have a kite and there's no wind, what's going to happen? It just stays on the ground. But when a gush of wind comes and picks up the kite, that kite, it dances through the sky, man. It's soaring like an eagle. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. This kite, it's marvelous. It's awesome. Kites, when the wind picks it up, it goes. And in a sense, I think that's what Luke's trying to tell us here, is that as the Spirit comes like wind, He picks up the believers in that home. And what we see next is they praise and they speak and they declare because of what the Holy Spirit has done in them. Um, I've got a We've got in our home a, a fireplace, and it's a, I don't think it's a very good fireplace, I've got to admit. It's lots of high maintenance. You guys ever have those high maintenance fireplaces? Man, you've got to tend to that thing every five minutes. I just want to read a book. It's crazy. What's the point of it? Like, seriously. But I like the outside fireplaces, the campfire, and you just, it's a big open one, you put a few pieces of wood in, it just goes up. And you just chuck another piece of wood on every 20 minutes, and it goes up. It's easy. But what does fire do? Fire brings what? Warmth, heat, but also brings light so you can see. Um, and I think Luke is wanting to use that, that language to tell us what the effects of the Holy Spirit um, were in this place. 
that as the disciples were in this waiting period, maybe in some darkness and doubt, the Spirit gave warmth and comfort. Jesus is here. When they couldn't see what the way forward or what they were to do, the Spirit enlightened them. They could see. Have you ever felt comforted by God in a really dark moment or enlightened to see Jesus and truth and beyond the lies of the world and past the cultural narratives that the world tells you? That's the Holy Spirit working in the believer. And here, Luke uses the language of wind and fire. Um, and what happens next is, is quite extraordinary. As um, the Spirit falls, and they can literally see like tongues of fire. So it's not like they can't see anything. And they can literally hear like a gushing wind. So there's visible and audible effects of the Holy Spirit here. Sometimes throughout the this history of the Bible, and even sometimes today, God can work in those ways. He doesn't always, but He can. There are many testimonies and stories of visions, seeing things, hearing things, feeling things of the way that God works. And we need to be okay with that. Sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't. I want to say actually the normal pattern he probably doesn't, but he does and he can and he will. Amen? And sometimes we box God into what we think and not trust him in what he does. And God can work in those ways. Um, We see that in Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 16. The pillar of fire, the cloud by day and the pillar by night in the Old Testament. All of these ways that God can manifest and express himself, visible, audible and feeling ways. It's not the ordinary experience, but it can can happen. And here it does. Uh, But what does the Holy Spirit do? In verse 4, I think this is the key verse. You ready? All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. Every single believer was filled with the Holy Spirit. And what happened? They spoke in other tongues. They spoke in other languages. So I'm uh, marrying into a uh, Chinese family and they speak Mandarin sometimes and I can't hear anything that they're saying. There's this language barrier going on. I actually am learning Mandarin currently and I'm Pray for me. I'm, I really want to grab this link because then I can hear if they're talking about me in family meetings <coughs> uh, and communicate and have a better relationship with the, with the family. Um, but there are some language barriers sometimes in life. And, and remember here, there are language barriers for the gospel going out to different people groups and to the world. But what happens here is quite remarkable. And as we keep reading, you'll see that God begins to break down these barriers right through power these barriers of language, these barriers of geography, and have a look at what what Blake read out for us from verse 5. Now, they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking, what? In their own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are these all not men who were speaking Galileans? Which means, how on earth are they speaking in our language if they are from Galilee? This poor old town that only produces tradies. Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native tongue? And he goes on to list all the places, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, um, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Persia, Pamphylia, man, Egypt, parts of Libya, near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, um, Cretans, Arabs, declaring the wonders of God in their own tongues, amazed and perplexed, they ask, what does this all mean? God breaks down barriers when he wants to work. And here, if geography was a barrier, well, guess what, guys? He brought the nations to himself. These were Jews, but from other places. And what we're getting here is this reverse of the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11, where once God scattered the languages and the nations, he's now bringing in the nations. Where he scattered the language and confused the languages, now he's using the language. And he empowers his disciples, his people, to speak in the other languages to break down those barriers. So plain and simply, um, there was no way that these people could have heard the gospel in their own tongue. But God shows up. And God empowers them through the Holy Spirit to speak in other languages that they can hear. There was no way that they could reach the ends of the earth from Jerusalem. But God brings them to Jerusalem to hear. And we're getting a glimpse of what the rest of the books of, book of Acts and the rest of church history um, kind of plays out in. This is extraordinary, amen? 
And you need to know that God breaks down barriers. And what we see next is there are two responses. Some people are amazed. Some people mock them and laugh. Are these guys drunk, they said? And then Peter goes on to, have you, maybe you're here and you're thinking, are these guys whacked up with this Christianity stuff? You guys ever thought that before? I used to think that before as a Christian. I mean, these guys are just on something, not of this world. I was like, amen, that's true. He's called the Holy Spirit and he's from heaven. But you need to know some people hear this stuff and the gospel of Jesus and go, that's whacked up, man. That's jacked. I don't believe that. You guys are crazy. But some people are amazed. And maybe the Spirit of God is changing your heart from being, that's whacked, to being, wow, that's extraordinary. And you need to tune into that and lean into that because God may be drawing you to himself for the very first time. But you need to know that God breaks down barriers through this power. And after people go, are they drunk? What does Peter say in verse, you can have a look on verse 14. Peter stood up and says, you guys, it's only, it's only nine in the morning. You see, in the festival season, they wouldn't start drinking until 10 o'clock. So he's like, man, what are you talking about? They're not drunk. This is what is happening. And he quotes this prophecy from Joel chapter 2. And he says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. You've got to really tune into this. And he says, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit. And they will prophesy. And then down in verse 21, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I'll invite the band up now as we, as we begin to close. But you need to understand this. A few of those things that were listed in that prophecy that Joel speaks 500 years before this happens. Not yet. He says this. He talks about age barriers. He talks about society's barriers. He talks about gender barriers. He says, I will pour out my spirit on sons and daughters. That's you if you're a young man. That's you if you're a young woman. He says, don't matter what your age, I will pour out my spirit on old and young. And it doesn't matter what class, whether you're poor, whether you're rich, I'm going to give it to slaves. I'm going to pour out my spirit on servants. And you need to know that if you're in any, in any way doubting what God can do in your life through a barrier, maybe you're thinking, hey, hey, Brandon, I can't understand these people when they speak. Well, God can break that barrier. If you're thinking, hey, Brandon, you know, they're too far away for me to reach. God can break through in that barrier. If you're thinking, I'm too young. I'm a girl. They'll laugh at me. I I'm not in the cool group. Well, God's saying it doesn't matter what barrier is in my way. I can break through with power in order to accomplish my plans and my purposes. If any of you are doubting what God can do, God wants to turn that from doubt into faith, from distrust into trust. God reverses the orders of society to bring the kingdom into our society. You've got to understand the kingdom of God is not like this world. It's different and He wants us to be different. And if you're in any way doubting what God can do, that there's a barrier either with language, either with who you are, either with who you're hanging around, either with what you're feeling currently with the family situation, Right, maybe the people you're with and, and maybe at school some, some oppression from teachers or from the principal. Right, God is saying it doesn't matter what barrier is in my way, I can overcome. Amen. Who believes that here? Because if you're not believing it, God wants to change you. Because He can. Because here we see an extraordinary barrier of geography and age and society. Right, and language. And God just smashes through in those things. And I think what God wants us to do now is actually to pray against these barriers and to pray that God would overcome them. You need to understand that God wants to use you and your mouth to declare the praises of God. I want you to just turn to your neighbor and say this, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Savior. Jesus is here. And I have a story that God has worked in. And I can tell that story to anyone 
in any place, in any time, because God has given me His Spirit that I can open my mouth and declare the wonders and the praises of His name. Who believes that here? Why don't you stand up and let's pray and ask God to break down some barriers. Why don't you stand up? Just stand in your seats, wait in your seats. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. Stand up. I'm going to ask you to stand. And, and what I want you to do is right now, right now, I want you to, in your heart and mind, just ask God to break down a barrier in your life, whatever that might be. That might be your own fear, your own laziness, but it could be someone, something, just right now in your own heart. Just bring that to the Lord. Bring that to the Lord right now. God, you broke the greatest barrier that ever existed. Our sin. And the power that sin had over us. That we were unable to know you and love you and worship you. But you broke that barrier through the Lord Jesus as he lived and died and rose and if you can do that, you can do absolutely anything. And so God, I, I ask that as these young people are just praying and giving you things in life that they feel like they can't overcome or that are in the way. And God, I pray that you would do a work by the power of your spirit to encourage them, to build them up. Some people here need to know that God can do that thing that you're thinking about. Some people need confidence, and I pray that, Lord, you would give them that confidence. Some people need humility. They're too confident and proud in themselves, and God needs to bring them down a peg. That's the barrier. Some people are very fearful of what people will think, and I just pray, Lord, that you would minister to them now and give them that absolute trust and faith in you and courage that is beyond their years. Some people here just have this internal battle within themselves that they can't escape their minds. There's this darkness that overcomes. And Lord, I believe you can give light to them. And so God, I want to ask that you would shed light into their minds, renew their minds, give them new minds, new hearts. There's some people here are in um, families or even school environments that are very restrictive as to what they can do and in an unhealthy way. And God, I want to pray that you would change those people's hearts to stop oppressing them and allow them to, be, um, to live in freedom and joy and love. Some people here haven't felt joy for years, for months. And the barrier is, is their own thoughts. And the barrier is suffering. And God, I want to pray that you would overcome those and bring them through that and bring them out to praise and, and give joy. Oh Lord, some here have had the barrier of rejection where they've asked their friend to come to youth group like five times. But God, you want to overcome those barriers. And when we just begin to doubt, I pray that you would bless us with faith and belief and trust that you can. And so, God, I want to pray for all of the people we're going to invite to next week into the Bring a Friend Night. And God, I want to ask that you would break through in barriers, break through with barriers, with power, so that those people who we're going to invite would come next week and hear the gospel. And as they hear the gospel, you would break down the barriers of their hearts, the walls of hostility that is blocking you from them. And as they hear the message of Jesus, your spirit would fall upon them and that they would be converted and brought into the family of Jesus Christ and know your love for the first time. God, we want to say amen. We want to say we love you. We want to say we trust you. And we believe you can break down barriers with this power. And so I want to invite you.